I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 25 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Brown. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. Mr Morrison's disastrous COVID summer resulting from his failure to listen to the warnings and take responsibility for ordering rapid antigen tests, his failure to learn from past mistakes, with Australians paying the price, spending hours in testing queues, days looking for rapid tests that were unavailable or overpriced, looking for basic supplies but finding only empty supermarket shelves, and mourning the loss of loved ones as hundreds of aged care residents died as provided, rap, providers grappled with staff shortages. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall, I shall ask the clerks set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this matter of utmost importance to Australians. We're all very privileged to be here in this place holding positions of leadership. And our communities have vested their trust in us to display the qualities of leadership they expect, especially in a time that is one of the most testing we face as Australians. But at a time when we most needed leadership to be guided with a sure hand through the many trials this pandemic has thrown at us, we have had an utter failure by this Prime Minister and his government to lead us. And nowhere is that failure of leadership being felt more than in remote Australia. The federal government has failed and ignored remote communities during the pandemic. The vaccination rollout, booster shots, aged care and supply of rats are federal responsibilities that have been bungled and mismanaged by Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Some territory communities still have double dose rates below 50 per cent and we have seen concerning outbreaks at aged care centres. Aged care is in crisis. Remote communities are running out of rats, and the health and aged care workforce out bush and in large centres is strained. In Alice Springs, there are cases being reported of elderly people being left without services under their home care packages. Elderly and vulnerable people left alone without a change of bed linen assistance in home cleaning and personal care for weeks. And I suspect this is the tip of a dreadful iceberg. How many vulnerable Territorians are there waiting in vain for their home care package services to be delivered who have no one to advocate for them, who have no family close by? I'm informed the services aren't being delivered because of a drastic workforce shortage and there are no plans in place from the federal government to assist. These cases of elderly people being left without services under their home care packages is a direct result of this government's failure to implement the findings of the Royal Commission into Aged Care. These are the consequences of not properly remunerating our aged care workforce, issues that were being felt long before COVID and have been exacerbated by this pandemic. And it's our elders who are paying the price. And if these are the failures we know about in the urban centres, where there is some scrutiny, what is the case in remote bush communities? Out of sight is so often out of mind at the best of times out there. From speaking with aged care services providers in some remote territory communities, I'm told that the federal government has not supplied one single rat to these providers, not one. Any that they have been able to get their hands on has been paid from, for their, uh, from them for the, from their own existing funding, putting pressures on other areas of service delivery to these centres. And the rats they have been able to get are prioritised for the vulnerable elderly. There is a shortage of rats and PPE for the aged care service workforce, adding extra strain to underpaid and under-resourced workers. And while the service provider workforce is out there on the ground caring for the elderly, Commonwealth agencies have been instructed to work from home. The federal government has completely abandoned the field in remote communities. Imagine how this leaves an exhausted and underpaid workforce feeling. They're out there doing the hard yards with zero support from the federal agencies. No sign of the National Indigenous Australians Agency in the bush, 
What a disgrace. The failure by the government to manage the Omicron outbreak is being felt dis disproportionately by women and children in remote Australia. Family and domestic violence services have been forced to expend their emergency relief funds on rats because, again, zero forthcoming from the federal government. So many have absolutely nothing left with five months to go until the end of financial year. There is a drastic shortage of alternative emergency accommodation and women and children are being left in dangerous, life-threatening situations because of this. We held a, an opportunity for a Teams meeting with a lot of these organisations, Madam Acting Deputy President, who spoke to us, uh, to myself uh, and certainly to our candidate for Lingiari, Marion Scrimger, to Warren Snowden, the current member for Lingiari, expressing these concerns directly about how domestic and family violence has increased during the COVID pandemic. And they gave examples of their inability to be able to get women out of some of our communities. And again, they've had to rely, in particular, the Alice Springs uh, Women's Shelter has had to pay an extraordinary amount of money out of its own funds for the rapid antigen tests to be available. This should not be happening, Madam Acting Deputy President. And there has been certainly no response from the federal government to the crisis. There are now 26,612 active coronavirus cases, with the virus infiltrating every region and many remote Aboriginal communities. It's certainly 6, 000, over 6,000 active cases in the Northern Territory. As of this morning, 174 people with COVID were in Territory hospitals, and on Sunday, tragically, the NT also recorded its fifth COVID-related death. Three people in the NT have died with coronavirus in the past week. And there are real worries, Mr President, about the impacts this is having on our health system right across the Northern Territory. Thank you. It being almost 5 p.m., I think we will move on. Senator Mirabella, you are ready to go? Pursuant to order, I will now call Senator Mirabella to make his first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to him. I call Senator Mirabella. Thank you, Mr. President. I begin by acknowledging my predecessor and yours, the Honourable Scott Ryan. There's a broad acknowledgement on all sides that both the former presiding officer, Senator Ryan, and his colleague, the Honourable Tony Smith, deserve plaudits for their service. Exemplary presiding officers both, fine Victorians both. And Senator Ryan was only the second Victorian to hold your office um, after Sir Magnus Cormack from 1971 to 1974. I am honoured to have been chosen by the Victorian Division of the Liberal Party to represent Victoria in the Senate. I am privileged to stand here today preparing to do my small part, as we all seek to, in shaping a better future for our country and future generations. The perspective I bring to the task of shaping Australia's future is a consequence of the journey that I have taken to reach this chamber today. That journey has been a little longer and more circuitous than most. On the way, I have been a business manager, a teacher, a soldier, an engineer and a farmer. I have worked in offices, on fishing boats, in classrooms and early in my life I experienced the struggles and challenges of small business. I have been fortunate to have first-hand experience in a broad range of areas that underpin how the world works—food production, infrastructure, technology and defence of the nation. And I have also come to know and believe in certain values, which I believe are critical both to an individual's pursuit of happiness and to the flourishing of our nation—a love of family, a commitment to service self-reliance, endeavour and enterprise. 
I am imbued with these things and they are fundamental to the perspective I bring to the parliament. But on this journey, no one comes into this parliament alone. Each of us had a lot of help to get here. So a few acknowledgements, although I can't name you all. I'm grateful to all the Liberal volunteers who give their time and effort and passion, to our rural membership who do the miles, and those special people who select and serve on the party's decision-making bodies. Thank you for your trust. I will name the small dedicated team who played a critical role in getting me here today. Mike Pountney, Sean Armistead, Jack Cook, Ben Zerby, Amanda and Rowan Miller, and James Radford, and from further afield, John Pollock, Andrew Schuller, and the best federal director the Liberal Party never had, Jerry Wheeler. <laughs> My four children are here today, Emily, Maddie, Alexandra and Kitty, and my mother, Mary, they are here today. Sadly, my father, Tim, passed away two weeks before my selection for this position, and he would be most annoyed with himself for not being here today. <laughs> of course, I want to acknowledge and praise my wife, Sophie. She was a member of the House of Representatives for 12 years. Her maiden speech was almost 20 years ago to the day. We are the fourth couple to have both served in the federal parliament, but I am the first husband to follow in the footsteps of his wife. And I am beyond proud to be doing so. Sophie was an extraordinary representative of the electorate of Indi. Energetic, passionate, incomparably hardworking. The fruits of her efforts are still fully evident today, although perhaps not sufficiently recognised. The residents of the Albury Wodonga region drive on the roads and the freeway that she fought to get built. The people of North East Victoria attend medical facilities that she fought to get funded. And they use sporting and community facilities that she was instrumental in building. And even before she entered parliament, she was able to work with then Prime Minister John Howard to secure hundreds of defence industry jobs in Benalla and across the river in Malwela. And after she left the parliament, she was instrumental in securing entitlements to hundreds of workers from Bruck Textiles. In office and out of office, she helped a lot of people. She still has my total admiration for both her work ethic and her commitment to the people of Indi. For Sophie, the 2013 election was bittersweet with the coalition's return to power, coinciding with the loss of her seat. As shadow industry minister prior to that election, Sophie did much to set the direction for the incoming government's approach to industry policy. There's been much written and said about the challenges that women face here in Canberra. Like many strong and vocal women in public life, Sophie has had to endure an unfair share of prejudice and discrimination that men do not. Her political opponents confected public vilification and then exploited it without shame. And some of these were other women. Mm. Sophie never got to deliver a valedictory, and I'm sure these remarks are hardly a good substitute. But the circumstance of her departure from the parliament was absolutely the catalyst for my decision to step into an active role in politics. If in my time here I can achieve a fraction of what she materially achieved, particularly for the people of regional Victoria, I will have done well. I've said I've had a few careers. Looking back now, on all the things I've been and done, I was most shaped as a soldier, an army engineer to be precise, a sapper. And I can tell you very specifically how I came to be a sapper. When I joined the Army Reserve during university, I trained as an infantryman, but it was during that time that I was fortunate enough to attend a few lectures by our honorary Colonel Commandant at that time, Sir Edward Dunlop. During these lectures, Weary would talk about his time as a prisoner of war in Singapore and Thailand. 
He painted a vivid picture of how he and others struggled to run makeshift hospitals to save the lives of their starving and diseased fellow prisoners. He showed us pencil drawings and watercolours made by prisoners at the time, and I recall them clearly. He showed us some of the expedient surgical instruments they devised from bamboo and bone in the jungle in Thailand. And during that particular presentation, an officer cadet asked him how many lives he thought he'd saved with those instruments. And I remember a portion of his response very well. He said, our medical staff didn't save anywhere near as many lives as the engineers. The engineers did the most amazing things to keep us supplied with fresh water and deal with our waste and build roofs and beds for us. Without the engineers, we'd probably all have died of disease and privation. I was the officer cadet who asked that question, and so he was answering me. And these were evocative words, and they made me want to do something useful with my time in the military. So I decided to become an army engineer. I wasn't studying engineering at the time, but I applied to join the Royal Australian Engineers and so started on a, a parallel career path. I studied and served part-time and full-time for two decades as a sapper officer. One of the mottos of the engineers is facimus et frangimus. We make and we break. <laughs> I was fortunate that most of my time as an active sapper was making rather than breaking. I learned how to build structures, roads, bridges. I learned how to purify water, how to prevent disease, the very same things Weary Dunlop talked about. In other words, I learned about all the basic things that a community of people need to live and survive. Clean water, shelter, roads. And I've enjoyed my time helping to build that infrastructure for communities here and abroad. But I'm not just a soldier. I think of myself a citizen soldier. For more than half my working life, I've worn the flag of my country on my sleeve, but the other half has been in civilian clothes. More recently, I've been a farmer. I am a senator of Victoria. But I've given myself the additional task of being a champion for regional Victoria. There are more than 21,000 farm businesses in the state, and Victoria has the largest agricultural output of all the states and territories. When I became part of a farming community, I discovered that generally farmers are just too busy to advocate for themselves, but I know from experience how hard it is to get farmers to stand up in front of a committee or an inquiry or write a submission. And yet, farmers in Victoria are subject to endless new regulations developed by an army of well-paid public servants who assume farmers have plenty of capacity to devote their unpaid time to reviewing and arguing against more and more regulation, regulation and spending more and more time on compliance. It is for this reason I intend to focus my time in the Senate on championing their issues by working to, to continue to increase access to health services in rural areas, especially mental health, by fighting for increased investment in rural infrastructure, both road and rail, and unceasing vigilance on water management. We are coming to the end of this, the 46th Parliament, which is an odd time to be delivering a first speech to this chamber. But it's also an historic moment to be delivering a first speech as we approach the end of a difficult but defining two years in the history of our nation. The COVID pandemic has tested many of our institutions, not least the Federation itself. It has forced us to consider the extent of our resilience and some say even our very sovereignty. Recent events have reminded us that Australia's strategic situation hasn't changed for 200 years. We are an island nation at the end of a very long maritime supply line. 
This has critical implications for self-sufficiency, especially in manufacturing and, of course, security. During this last two years, we've faced shortages of imported goods. This has put our local manufacturing capabilities under the microscope. Although empty supermarket shelves are not as critical as shortages of machine or electronic components, to a farmer waiting for a crucial part for a tractor, toilet paper shortages are a mild inconvenience. Our exports too have been challenged. China punished our beef and wine trade because of a diplomatic slight. Well, with some difficulty, we've lived with that and found new markets. And it remains unclear whether our mutual trade interests with China will prevail over the long term. These imposed interruptions to our trade, incoming and outbound, have exposed the fragility of our supply chains. Now, I'd like to tell a parable which illustrates the vulnerabilities we must address. We've just had the AdBlue crisis, which threatened to put our trucking fleets off the road. AdBlue is a simple commodity. Most people have never heard of it. It helps reduce harmful emissions from diesel engine exhausts. But what is it? Well, it's just a urea and water solution. Urea is not hard to make, but it's one of the many thousands of things that we used to produce but for which there is almost no business case to manufacture locally anymore, until we can't import it, of course. Fortunately, there's a plant in Brisbane that's been able to ramp up its operations to produce urea, but I note that plant was due to close this year. The AdBlue incident throws up a number of issues we need to address at a national level. Firstly, the capabilities of our domestic petrochemical industry is a matter of concern, both production and storage. But we need to look more broadly than that. We need to examine what disruption to globalised supply chains really means for us, whatever the cause. Now, urea is made from coal or gas, commodities which were in short supply during this northern hemisphere winter a situation probably exacerbated by all those ships full of Australian coal sitting at anchor in Chinese ports for months. But this incident demonstrates the world's reliance on hydrocarbons and coal and how shortages of these commodities still affect most nations at a national level. Consider the European winter energy markets right now. Energy generation is struggling and the price of Russian gas into Western Europe has tripled. And by the way, it's hardly worth asking whether Russia is likely to separate its strategic leverage of military force supply of gas to Germany. So to start drawing some threads together, here in Australia we need to be examining our national self-reliance. What's the balance between allowing global markets to deliver cheap goods versus critical shortages when supply chains are disrupted? I'd love to see more manufacturing in this country, smart manufacturing. And to be able to achieve that, we need smart people, great education and training, and capital applied where it's best used. But manufacturing also needs energy, electric energy cheap and clean energy. It used to be one of our national competitive advantages. Electricity is the single greatest enabler of our modern civilization to our standard of living. For more than a century, we've been burning fossil fuels to generate that energy. And we know we can't keep doing that. And globally, we are grappling with the conundrum the social demand for an accelerated shutdown of coal power and a lack of viable alternatives. With my farmer's hat on and my engineer's prism, I look at the energy issues and the manufacturing issues and the sovereignty issues, and it's easy to conflate them. Everything connects to everything else. As an engineer, what I've focused on in recent years 
is how we improve the fundamentals of how we make the world work, how we improve the management of our resources and ecosystems efficiently and cleanly. I'm a farmer. I care for the land and my environment. I look at all the problematic issues—water, clean water, water for agriculture. And, by the way, even water is becoming a strategic commodity in and between some countries. Waste, municipal waste, it's a critical problem everywhere. Agriculture, green waste, livestock methane emissions, fertilisers for agriculture and emissions from industrial processes such as steel production. All these issues are connected. They are connected by the king of elements, carbon, organic biomass, it's basic chemistry. Reducing atmospheric CO2 is what we want to achieve, but the term decarbonising doesn't actually make sense to a chemist. The solutions to all our challenges start with energy. The first consideration is that there is a limit to how much intermittent energy we should be putting into our grid. And Germany is a salutary lesson here. High level of intermittent generation, the most unstable grid with the most expensive electricity in Europe, mainly because of expensive Russian gas for peaking plants. It's worth pointing out, by the way, that households only consume about 20 per cent of all the electricity we generate. The rest goes to commercial and industrial use. For all the rooftop solar we've installed, we still need a lot of spinning baseload. The Prime Minister has said that the path to, to cleaner energy is in technology, not taxes. I agree. I am a proponent of hydrogen and ammonia as the fuels of the future. We need to be able to produce hydrogen in large quantities cleanly. And to make ammonia, you've actually got to make hydrogen first. I believe we will still be relying on biomass, including coal, for some time. But I also believe the future is not burning it. We will be chemically reforming biomass and methane into hydrogen and to ammonia, as already happens. But when we work out how to do it while capturing the CO2, we'll be producing clean hydrogen at such a scale that we can put it straight into turbines and make electricity, lots of it, cheaply a new gas industry, and it will use only a fraction of the biomass we currently burn and will solve a, lot, solve a lot of our waste problems at the same time. Is this a fantasy? I don't believe so. Current waste to energy systems are already evolving down this path. Time does not permit me to say as much as I'd like here, particularly to the sceptics, but I will say this. Whichever country wins the race of large-scale clean hydrogen production will win an economic bonanza and will lead the world to a better future. And I intend that it is Australia. I want to make a comment about the Voices candidate set to contest the federal election. Why do I mention this here? Because these Voices candidates cite their major platform as lack of action on climate change. They say they're independents, who aren't really a political party, really. They look and sound like one. They even have a Senate candidate preaching the need for transparency in politics while denying scrutiny of themselves. I share the concern of many of a hung federal election result. Now, these voices candidates are very well schooled in avoiding answering the question as to who they would support to form government, but there is, of course, no doubt. They are all contesting only against coalition members. The notion that any of them would support the coalition is absurd. 
They are therefore the voices for Labor. I am gravely concerned at how a Labor Greens Voices Coalition would accelerate climate, change, uh, climate action, ban coal, shut down more baseload generation. This country is already at the point where we do not need more intermittent generation. I have already referred to Germany. Is that the nirvana where these voices people might take us? A fragile grid, unaffordable energy, blackouts? Australians most definitely don't want that. Australia has the resources to become a leader in hydrogen energy, and in so doing we will at once be enabling cheaper energy, more manufacturing and greater self-reliance. If we can reap this harvest, we will improve our ability to better fund education, health and aged care. But to achieve this, we really need to knock down a few silos and recast some of the business of government. Trade, energy, industry, security, they are interdependent in this context. It is a first order challenge for the future. Better applying policy and public funds to address our sovereign self-sufficiency in ways which actually contribute to prosperity. On my final theme of security, defence and foreign policy, I will confine my comments. First, the manner in which we equip the ADF. I know firsthand how lengthy and convoluted our acquisition processes are, and we must improve them. Changes in technology are occurring at 21st century speed, but our decision processes still seem stuck in the last century. Several months ago, the government announced the purchase of, or the choice, actually, of uh, new artillery equipment, and that's great. But I recollect that project, Land 17, was entered into the Defence Capability Program during my time working in force development in 2005. That's nearly 17 years ago. The Defence Minister is rightly taking a more rigorous approach to this problem, and I applaud him. Uh, he was right to recognise a bad decision on our new submarines. He's also right to project an increased defence budget for coming years. We cannot provide credible protection to our maritime supply lines and our region if we don't. And uh, an additional note about the role of the ADF. In recent times, we've seen the ADF employed on civil defence tasks. The recent horror summer bushfires and support to covert operations being cases in point. As a citizen soldier, I support this. There's been discussion in recent days about whether the ADF is a standby workforce. No, it isn't. The mission of the ADF is to protect Australia and its interests. And to me personally, that mission absolutely includes civil defence operations. As a soldier, I've commanded army support to bushfire operations under the Defence Aid to the Civil Community System. I once watched people in a town, not far from where I live now, surrounded by fires for weeks, come out into the street and cheer and cry when the big green trucks roll through, towing bulldozers, carrying a hundred sappers with chainsaws. I have never felt so proud of wearing my uniform as I did that day. When these people told me that they knew that now everything was going to be all right, the Prime Minister knew of their plight and he sent them. We weren't a backup workforce. We were soldiers and we were there to protect them, to protect them and their homes, and we did. I support any measures to equip and prepare elements of the ADF to provide this kind of support for the future as a matter of course. And as a final note on defence matters, and certainly not least, I intend to do what I can to better support veterans. We need to do a lot better than we've done in recent years. To draw to a conclusion, I've already laboured the point that events of the last two years have shone the spotlight on a range of issues that go to the heart of Australia's well-being. I've drawn the thread. Self-reliance, energy, manufacturing, security. 
One of the most important lessons that I have learned in my various careers is that lessons are too often not well learned, especially at a bureaucratic and political level. Bushfire inquiries are an outstanding example. Defence equipment acquisitions are another. Pandemic lessons need to be not just learned but embedded and protected. The health lessons and the economic and social lessons. This is a time when we need to be striving to make sure that we do not forget the lessons of today. This is a time when we need to be making considered and informed decisions about Australia's ability to prosper as a free and self-determining nation. I want my four beautiful daughters to inherit a nation and a world which is in better shape than my generation found it. I hope to bring my particular perspectives to bear on policy and public debate to help achieve this. It's the farmer's job to feed the nation and it's the engineer's job to build all that makes it work. And it's the soldier's job to protect the people. And it does not occur to me for a moment that these do not remain my tasks, even as I serve from this place. Thank you, Mr President.
Uh, just before we move back to the MPI, I believe you're seeking the call, Minister Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation. Uh, is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. I move that today the hours of meeting be 9:30 a.m. to an adjournment. The routine of business from 7:20 p.m. be consideration of the mitochondrial donation law reform, MAVE's Law Bill 2021 only. Divisions may take place after 7.20 for the purposes of the bill only, and the question for the adjournment be proposed after consideration of the bill concludes or at 9pm, whichever is the earlier. I will put that motion. Those in uh, favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We will now return to the MPI, and I am calling Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. What a stark contrast it was to hear such an excellent first speech of Senator Mirabella. Full of her positivity, it was uplifting, it was sincere, it was about service to the nation. The sort of senator and public servant we actually want and need in this place. And that speech was such a juxtaposition to that which we had heard earlier from the Labor Party in this so-called MPI. They want to blame Mr Morrison for everything. In fact, the motion starts, Mr Morrison's disastrous summer. Well, I suppose we blame him that it was a bit of a colder summer than usual, that the barbecue gas ran out or the kids got sunburnt. Yet, really, what is the Labor Party on about when they come into this place day after day with their relentless negativity and their commentary on everything that is wrong without pausing to consider that they might actually be presenting themselves as an alternative government, not a whisper as to what they would be doing differently. What we hear is just this tirade of negativity including, might I add, Mr Acting Deputy President, what I find amazing, because we heard it in question time today and again in the contribution from the Labor Speaker just before the first speech by Senator Mirabella. And it was about the underpaid workers in aged care. There is no doubt that aged care workers do a fantastic job. There is no doubt that they are low-paid workers. But who sets their wage rates? It is not the government. It is not the Prime Minister. It is an independent tribunal known as, the, as Fair Work Australia. And I wonder who set that up and then stacked it out with their people. It was the Australian Labor Party. It is the Australian Labor Party's mechanism for wage fixation in this country. And so when the Labor Party comes into this place day after day complaining about the low wages for aged care workers, what it is is a double whammy criticism, one, of the trade union movement that is allegedly looking after these people, but also the independent umpire who determines the wages. Now, the Australian Labor Party, like with so many other things, seeks to have it both ways. They say day after day, the Liberal National Party cannot change the fair work legislation. And we haven't in this regard. It is the legislation as put down by Ms Gillard, Prime Minister Rudd, remember him, and Mr Shorten. Well, that mechanism remains in place. So each and every day when the Australian Labor Party complains about somebody's wages and or conditions, they are complaining about the decision-making process of the organisation that they themselves established. It therefore begs the question, what would Labor do if they were in government? Would they sack the Fair Work Commission for not providing sufficient wages to aged care people? Or would they somehow legislate wages and start having this parliament determining who gets paid what, when, how and why? Surely not. 
So this is a vacuous criticism that they offer day after day in a vain attempt to con the Australian people into believing that somehow they might be able to do a better job. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, we know that the Labor Party is devoid of any future policy positioning. If they had good future policies, instead of putting up these motions as they do day after day, full of relentless negativity, they'd be saying that we call on the government to adopt Labor policy in this particular area. And the Labor policy is, and they would set it out seriatim, A, B, C, D, etc., and tell the Australian people exactly what they want, what their aspiration is for the Australian people. But they have no aspiration for the Australian people. They only have an aspiration for themselves and somehow cheat their way into government by offering continual criticism of a government that has been in exceptionally difficult circumstances delivering for the people of Australia. And let's be clear, in the three years of this government, we have had, we've seen 1.1 million jobs created since the pandemic hit. And do you know what? Labor's shadow treasurer said that the one test the Morrison government has to pass is the unemployment rate. Will it hit a certain level or not? Well, it is well below expectations. That's the unemployment rate is well below expectations. So by Labor's standard, the standard, the one standard by which Labor said the Morrison government should be judged, the Liberal National Party government should be judged, namely on the employment level, it has passed with flying colours. It is not me, a Liberal senator, asserting this. It is, by implication, the Australian Labor Party asserting this, because they set the test and the test the Labor Party set for the Liberal National Party government has been passed with flying colours, whether the Labor Party likes it or not. So, having set us a benchmark, which we have surpassed as a government, what else is Labor to offer other than to pick up any little rock that is available and throw it at us as a government? There's no positivity. There is no vision for the future. There's no policy platform on which to see the nation come out of this COVID pandemic. We are doing, as a nation, relatively well. Can we do better? Of course we can do better, and that is what the government continually strives for day after day, Mr Acting Deputy President. But what this nation does not need is a group of individuals who have only one vision, and that is <coughs> for them to be elected to government. Now, for Labor to be elected to government, the Australian people need the full policy platform, what they would actually do, what they would do differently and how. It's no use saying we would have done better in this area or that area. Tell us how that would have been achieved with all the constrictions and restraints that COVID have placed upon us. And so, Mr Acting Deputy President, 1.1 million jobs created, surpassing Labor's test. And I'm sure that the hapless shadow Treasurer thought in setting us this task on unemployment that we would fail it. And he put it up there in lights for everybody to see, only to find us not only match it, but overwhelmingly surpass that benchmark. And so humiliated, the Labor Party retreats to that which it is, I must say, exceptionally good at, and that is throwing rocks and offering criticism, but they are incapable of providing that positive agenda. And the record of the Prime Minister and the Treasurer speaks for itself. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, I've concentrated on that which uh, the Labor Party sent, set us as a benchmark. But look, Let's have a look. 1,400 additional nurse placements for the regions. 
um, one billion dollars to help with closing the gap. Ninety-three per cent of Indigenous children enrolled in preschool, which is up from 77 per cent in 2016. You go through policy parameter after policy parameter, and you see achievement by this government in the most difficult of circumstances. And so the ministry has performed exceptionally well, and the benchmarks set by the Australian Labor Party have been met, achieved, and indeed overachieved. And so all that Labor does is come in here, provide their relentless negativity, no real alternative for the people of Australia, and that is why motions such as this put forward by the Labor Party day after day should be rejected. And if I was in the opposition, I'd be putting forward a positive platform. But devoid of that, all they do is throw rocks. Senator Bates. Senator Roberts, you have Deputy call. President, as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that the federal and state governments have had a disastrous two years of COVID mismanagement. Not just one summer. Go out the front and have a listen. Go anywhere in Australia and have a listen. Australia has seen a repeated failure to learn and do better from one year to the next, and it's now counting in years. The failure of this government to modify COVID response as more information has emerged about the science of this virus is criminal incompetence. Our competitive federalism model has been mocked and abused and buried in some perverse game of pass the parcel so that everyday Australians can have no clear idea of who is to blame for this mess. I know who's to blame. It's all of you. All of you have waved through ill-prescribed and illogical measures for more than two years, one after the other. From one state to another, the same science and data on COVID has been translated into wildly different responses, depending upon the ideology and personality flaws of the premiers and chief ministers of the day and the federal ministers. Yet on each occasion, with each different policy, the phrase was the same, trust the science, but don't show us the science. The last two years has seen a litany of nonsense and lies, lie after lie, dressed up as medicine and science. Here are just some of them. The unresolved definition of a hotspot, inability to agree on sensible measures for border communities, seemingly arbitrary closing of borders and locking down of communities for minor outbreaks, while then being allowed to open up during major outbreaks. I mean, this, is, this is incredible to, to see, marginalising the unvaccinated in some states but not in others. The changing definition of fully vaccinated, making commitments to people and then contradicting them. As a nation, we have been held captive to measures that have divided our communities, coerced people into a medical procedure in order to keep our jobs, denied freedom of choice over our bodies, when we can open our businesses, where we can travel, whether we can see our family and friends, whether we can attend a funeral or a wedding, and kept any dissent suppressed by media accomplices. The media have crafted the narrative into a singular government-sanctioned message, essentially propaganda and lies. Disasters and calamities can have a powerful galvanising effect for communities, like we see during bushfires and floods. Yet during COVID, our governments have successfully eroded our cohesiveness as an Australian nation, fractured it. This is the first time I've seen a national emergency responded to by dividing Australians instead of uniting against the common threat. Instead of helping one another, we find ourselves treating others like, peer, like lepers and retreating from anyone who coughs or sniffles. We've been brainwashed into division, disrespect and telling lies and telling tales on anyone we believe isn't being compliant. The federal government have squandered the opportunity to bring Australia together as a nation by letting the states and territories run wild with stupidity and deceit. Liberal, Labor, Nationals and Greens, governments all. Historically, our ADF are brought in to help domestically in catastrophic and emergency situations. So it says a lot about how the state and federal governments have mishandled their response to COVID when, after two years of COVID experience, we need 1,700 ADF personnel to go into our aged care sector because the staff have left because they've had to because they've been threatened with, with a forced vaccination. Debacle after debacle has left our aged care sector completely under-resourced. Staffing has been ravaged by vaccine mandates and unreasonable close contact rules. It makes no sense to me that Labor would try to pin on the Morrison-Joyce government alone when the Labor Party, when this parliament, state and federal parliaments, waved these measures through for two years. To steal a line from driving Miss Daisy, Senator Brown, 
you took that turn with the government. It's too late now to dodge the blame. You're all to blame. The unnecessary deaths within aged care from government incompetence are heartbreaking and shameful, immoral and inhuman. So too are the continual lockdowns of elderly residents who have prevented the elderly, you have, which have prevented the elderly from seeing their families, leading some to believe they've been abandoned. It's not their families who have abandoned them, it's this parliament. It's all of you. The disrespect shown to our elderly is breathtaking. While there are ethical questions about balance between opening up and our most vulnerable being exposed on COVID, there's absolutely no acceptable excuse for the state and federal government's logistical failures during this entire atrocious mess. How can we do this to our families and communities? We're still stumbling as a nation two years later. The federal and state leaders have gutted the dignity and rights of everyday Australians through their ineptness and an unprecedented thirst for power and control. At a time when Australians needed hope, reassurance, leadership and confidence in their leaders. Is it any wonder this incompetence, this arrogance and hubris, hubris has brought Thank protesters you, onto Roberts. the streets in their millions? Senator Roberts, your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise, to, I rise to make a contribution on this matter of public importance. According to the Minister for Aged Care, the aged care system has been coping with the Omicron variant extremely well. That is a direct quote. Extremely well. That is an opinion that the minister might have formed from his VIP seats at the fifth test of the ashes. Of course, if the minister fronted up to the committee on COVID-19, the Senate committee, the minister had, and if the minister had done his job and shown up for that committee instead of fobbing us off to go to the cricket, then the minister would know that actually the aged care system is not coping extremely well. Usually, if a system is coping extremely well, you don't have to call the military in to provide emergency support. If the minister, instead of going to the cricket, had done his job and talked to aged care residents and families or just simply read the paper, he would have known things are not going extremely well. He would know that more than 500 Australians in aged care died from COVID-19 in January alone. But the government says, don't worry about that. The Minister for Health said 60 per cent of those who had died in aged care, and I quote, in the absolute last days of their lives. How is that for a message from the Morrison government? In the absolute last days of their lives. That's how they describe that, those people that lost their, lost their life due to COVID. What a reassurance to the from the government to those people that lost loved ones and those ones those that fear of losing their loved ones. I doubt that provides any support to the families of those who have tragically passed away. Is this really the point we've gotten to in the government's handling of the pandemic? That we are now just brushing away hundreds of preventable deaths as being insignificant. It is an unprecedented in Australian history what's going on in our aged care sector. The fact is, the vaccine rollout had not started months, had started months and months behind. If the booster rollout had not, start, not started months behind, we might have been in a better position. Then we would not have seen hundreds of unboosted aged care residents tragically passing away in January. But that is the aged care system the government insists is performing extremely well. If the minister had spoken to aged care providers instead of going to the cricket, he would have known that this isn't the case. Mike Baird, the former Liberal Premier of New South Wales and current CEO of aged care provider Hammond Care, has been calling for the Australian Defence Force to be called in to the aged care sector since mid-January. It took more than three weeks for the government to heed that call. And as always, with this government, it's too little, too late. And if the minister had spoken to aged care workers instead of going to the cricket, he would know things are not going extremely well. Aged care workers are under unbelievable stress. They can't access rapid antigen tests. They can't access enough PPE. They can't access enough N95 masks. 
It has been a year since the Aged Care Royal Commission handed down its final report. And let's remind ourselves what the report said. And I quote, Australia's aged care system is understaffed and the workforce underpaid and undertrained. The bulk of the aged care workforce does not receive wages and enjoy terms and conditions of employment that adequately reflect the important caring role they play. Inadequate staffing levels, skill mix and training are principal causes of substandard care in the current system. That's what the Aged Care Commission made very clear. And it couldn't have been clearer to anyone reading those words. There's a link between the conditions of aged care workforce and the quality of care. And a year on, the government hasn't learnt a single thing. Unlike the minister, aged care workers aren't blowing off work for VIP tickets to the ashes. Aged care workers, most of them who are in insecure and precarious jobs, are being pushed to the limit. Nine in ten aged care workers are either casual or part-time. They are in danger of their shifts being swapped or cut at the drop of a hat. Many have expected to remain on call all day, every day. Last year, Sherry Clark, a casual aged care nurse, told the Job Security Inquiry uh, Committee I quote, you can't plan anything because you don't know what your roster is going to be from one fortnight to the next. When my mother went through cancer, I couldn't tell her that I would support her to, for her cancer appointments because if they're not available to pick up a shift, they don't offer you that shift the next time. Now, for all this, they are woefully underpaid. These are people tasked with looking after our parents and our grandparents. These are workers sometimes responsible for every facet of senior Australians' day-to-day -day lives. And they're receiving pay barely above the minimum wage. Another casual aged care worker, Anu Singh, told the Job Security Committee the last year that at her workplace place, there were just two carers for 20 residents. They would have 20 minutes with each resident, and I quote, in those 20 minutes, we used to wake up our residents, who were about 90 years old, and do showering, toileting, dressing and undressing, tidy up their rooms, make their beds, and then take them slowly to their dinner. Can you imagine doing all that in just 20 minutes while making barely above the minimum wage? Even before the pandemic, that sounds like an, and this is of course even before the pandemic. The aged care system is doing extremely well. And then putting a complete botched COVID-19 response on top of that. So I support in the strongest terms the health services union's comments, who have called on the government to back the HSU's application for a decent aged care wage rise. And is the absolute least this government can do for those workers. The other point I want to cover is the stress the pandemic is having on the, as a result of the government responses to problems within the supply chains. We have seen workers like at those at Tees Meatworks in Narra Court forced to work while COVID positive. We have seen truck drivers and supply chain workers continue to work tirelessly to keep shelves stocked. Even as the government stands by and allows their jobs to be undermined by companies like Uber and Amazon, the race to the bottom. We have seen retail and logistics workers forced to continue working even without fair access to rapid antigen tests. And this week, the Retail Supply Chain Alliance came to Canberra to call for government backing for the new supply chain safety principles. The three principles are very simple but very important. The first is that we need COVID safety supply chains. That means free and accessible rapid antigen tests for transport, logistic and retail workers. Not just for their own personal safety, but to keep all Australians safe and to keep supply chains running. The second principle is that we need to secure working conditions in supply chains. That means immediate government action 
to stop the race to the bottom on worker conditions being driven by companies like Amazon. And the third is that we need a supply chain committee. Throughout this pandemic, the government has failed to listen to advice from medical experts and from the industry. Instead of sensible planning and thoughtful solutions, we had ideas like children driving forklifts. Just absurd. We need a committee that brings together government, industry, unions and workers to find real solutions to supply, to supply chain issues and to ensure that we don't have any more stupid and deadly ideas like kids on forklifts. Supply chain workers, aged care workers, health workers and workers across Australia deserve better than insecure work, wages failing up to keep up with the cost of living and a shortage of rapid antigen tests. This government needs to act and it needs to act now. It's not a job well done. Senator Davey. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I want to remind the Chamber of, of the motion we're actually debating here tonight because um, it hasn't been clear when you listen to the contributions from those on the other side. Uh, this motion, which was put forward by Labor, uh, talks about the disastrous COVID summer, um, accuses the government of failing to listen to warnings, failing to take responsibility for ordering rapid antigen tests and failing to learn from past mistakes. Um, now, I wonder how Labor would have done anything differently when you actually look at the timelines, when you actually look at what was happening right around the world and when you consider the scientific and expert advice that we are always told we've got to listen to. Listen to the experts, listen to the scientists, take on board what they're saying and act according to that advice. Well, let me remind people that even as late as August last year, the advice from the AHPPC was discouraging the use of rapid antigen tests when the prevalence of COVID was low. They said rats in August last year should only be used as a precautionary, precautionary surveillance measure and they recommended their use only for health care settings. But according to Labor, somehow we should have ignored that advice and preempted things even before the Therapeutic Goods Authority had even approved the use of rats at, for home use. We were actually ahead of the game because as soon as the TGA approved point of care use of rats, we entered into agreements with suppliers we secured 4.45 million rat tests and we commenced a trial for point of care rat testing in aged care settings. But Labor would like to ignore that fact and pretend that it all only occurred over summer. Over summer. Our summer, which was the European winter at which time the whole world was struggling to source enough rats. But somehow we should have miraculously been able to access them when countries like the United States, Europe, the UK, Canada all could not fulfil their own demand for rats. We should have been immune to a global supply shortage during a global pandemic, according to Labor. Well, that's just living in fairyland, really. Don't forget as well that even after the TGA had approved use for rats in home settings, even after 
the government had started a procurement program. The states had still not approved their use. Let's not forget that when Omicron raised its ugly head in Australia in late November, and when the states responded by shutting their borders, it was the states who insisted that they would take nothing short of a PCR test as proof of COVID negativity. Queensland kept that up all the way until January, such that the demand for PCR tests in New South Wales did go through the roof, not from people showing symptoms of COVID, not from people who were close contacts, but from people who wanted to go on holiday, from people who wanted to visit their family. And Senator Sheldon talks about the squeeze on our freight and supply chains. Well, the squeeze was exacerbated by these state-based policy principles that required all truckies to have PCR tests because rat tests weren't good enough. This was state labour demanding PCR tests so that their trucks carrying their groceries could get over the border to deliver to their supermarket shelves. Labor somehow thinks that we had a crystal ball. Somehow, according to Labor, we should have been able to foresee Omicron. Who only declared, as in the World Health Organization, only declared Omicron a variant of concern on the 26th of November? By which stage we had already entered into these rat trials at aged care settings. We had already commenced a procurement program, but we still didn't have Omicron in our country, and no one could have predicted the scourge that Omicron brought. And I want to also talk about the issues in aged care settings. COVID has always represented a risk in aged care. From the very first COVID outbreak in aged care that occurred in New South Wales in 2020, we established a surge workforce to support facilities where staff were sidelined through COVID infection or close contact or where they just needed support. This surge workforce has been in place ever since, available for every state and for any facility that requested it. To date, that surge workforce has covered over 80,000 shifts. And yes, at the moment, Omicron is rapidly spreading and our workforce needs to adjust. And yes, we now have the Defence Force assisting in that area. But somehow Labor thinks that they would have foreseen all of this. I want to take this opportunity to thank our aged care workforce and the surge workforce and the defence force who have all worked tirelessly to do their utmost to keep the residents of our aged care facilities healthy and safe. I want to acknowledge that working in aged care is difficult at the best of times regardless of COVID. It is a very sad fact that people in aged care facilities pass on. It's worse when they pass on separated from their families due to quarantine requirements in response to a one in a hundred year pandemic. I feel for those who work in this situation and I feel for the families that have lost their loved ones I don't care whether the resident has passed away from COVID, with COVID or without COVID. It's always sad. It's always a loss. But Labor seemed to be implying that if they were in charge, things would be different. So I want to know how. It's all very well and good to stand here and throw stones when you've got no responsibility for cleaning up the shards of glass afterwards. But Labor, how would you have addressed the situation to ensure that facilities were not locked down 
during the various waves of COVID to ensure families still had access to their loved ones? Because I don't see how. I have family in hospital right now that can't be visited by anyone because they're all operating under COVID restrictions. We're in this place operating under COVID restrictions, but somehow Labor would wave a magic wand and it wouldn't be occurring. How would Labor make sure that staff at our aged care facilities would not come into contact with COVID? and would be available for 100 per cent of their shifts so they didn't need a surge workforce, so they didn't need the defence force. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but you cannot judge our government on what you know now for hindsight. Judge us on where we are at today, on how we have responded and learnt and adapted to ensure we continue to have a strong economy record low unemployment, the higher, one of the highest vaccination rates and one of the lowest COVID death rates in the world. I think we've done quite well, all things considered. Thank you. Senator Still John. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This, this summer has been a summer from hell for disabled people. It has been a summer of fear, a summer of isolation and a summer of death. Disabled people have died across our community and the Morrison government bears responsibility. The incompetence, the absolute and total inability to listen to disabled people when we reach out to our government, as we have done through every stage of this pandemic, at the beginning when we thought we were going to drop dead any minute, we put everything aside, put aside our historic knowledge that at the hands of this government, all oh, how we have suffered, we put that aside and attempted to work to keep our community safe. We did so many unpaid hours of work, organisations that have been structurally underfunded for the best part of a decade, put everything on hold to come and sit with you people at a table and offer our best hopes and our lived experience and our expertise for the sole goal of keeping our friends and our family and our loved ones alive. And you did what you always do. You took our good faith and you repaid it with tokenism. And once we started to get a bit annoying, you shut us out of the process. And you failed us through the first wave. You failed to order the vaccine. You failed to roll the thing out. When it stopped working as it should have, you deprioritised us. You deprioritised disabled people to cover up your own incompetence. Through Delta, you failed to get us PPE. You failed to invest in ventilation. You failed to order the tests that your own Prime Minister was out at press conferences saying we would need. And it all came to bear in Omicron, driven by your corporate donors, so desperate to begin making money again. You rammed down the borders and the protective mechanisms. People like the Premier of New South Wales lectured the community, lectured the community about the need to stand up to COVID, to live with the pandemic. Well, for a disabled person, for an older person, for the immunocompromised, for First Nations people, there is no living with COVID-19. Unprotected, unvaccinated, unsupported, we die and we have died and we will continue to die under this government and you bear that responsibility. We had so many chances as a nation to get this right, so many opportunities to order the right vaccines, to give people the money they needed to manage, 
to give people access to the PPE, to put the ventilators in the schools, to give people the confidence and ability to manage this together. And at every turn, because it was too inconvenient, because it cost your donors too much money, because it dared to suggest that there is such thing as a society wherein one and other have a mutual obligation to each other, you rejected it. And two years in, two years in, not a single person in the Australian government can tell me how many disabled people have died. Because nobody has been collecting the data. And every day, chief health officers, state premiers go out to the media, they give the COVID death figures, but they assure us so many of these people had underlying conditions. So many of them were at the end of life or had a terminal condition. Complex, co-occurring morbidities. 40% of the Australian population either has a disability or an underlying condition, and this government and state governments have written us off as an acceptable collateral casualty. Not good enough. The Greens do not accept it. We will never accept it. Senator we will Steele always John, push your back. Time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, across the country, millions of Australians have experienced a summer of COVID chaos that they simply did not need to have. More vaccine delays, a COVID testing disaster, critical staff shortages everywhere, and yet another aged care crisis. And none of it was inevitable, none of it. All of it was preventable. If only the Morrison government had listened to any of the experts that were ringing the alarm bells. If only they had listened to the experts who were saying that the government needed a plan to open up safely. At the end of last year, Prime Minister Morrison was out there urging us all to get used to COVID normal, uh, saying that it was time for government to get out of our lives, revving us up for an open summer. Uh, but unlike this Prime Minister, COVID doesn't like to take holidays, and the government should have had a plan for that. Uh, instead, the Prime Minister checked out over the summer again, and he did that as the Omicron wave hit. And at that time, it was Australians who were ready. Australians wanted to do the right thing to protect their families, to protect their communities. They wanted to get tested. They wanted to stay safe. They wanted to be able to go to work. They were ready, but the Morrison government was not. Within days of restrictions easing and travel restrictions easing, we saw absolute chaos. We saw PCR tests being overwhelmed. We saw people lined up uh, for miles waiting to get tested, only to be turned away. No one could find a rapid antigen test uh, across the country, uh, and we were in crisis again a crisis that was not inevitable, a crisis all because the Prime Minister failed to plan again. He failed to heed the warnings again. He failed to listen to the experts again. And as early as September last year, the Australian Medical Association warned the government publicly, and we all know that they needed a plan for rapid antigen tests to support a safe reopening. The government rejected that advice, saying something about not wanting to intervene in the private market. Well, we all saw what the private market did later on. Then in October, the government ignored the calls by the Council of Small Business to provide rapid antigen tests. They dismissed calls from small business that they needed rat tests to keep their doors open. And even before that, uh, a year before that, Australian manufacturers had approached the government about providing rapid antigen tests made here in Australia for Australians. What happened with that? Government sent them away, said we don't need them. Meanwhile, other countries who had real leaders, real leaders who were on the ball, knew that they needed rapid antigen tests and started putting 
calls in, orders in, with our Australian manufacturers. So why didn't Prime Minister Morrison? Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he do that? Why couldn't he see what was happening overseas? That in the UK, free tests had been available since April 2021. That in Singapore, they were in vending machines. But despite all of these warnings, despite these representations from small business, despite these representations from the manufacturers, despite representations from the medical experts, the government refused to heed any of these warnings. They refused to take the advice. The Morrison government simply failed to act and they left Australians without a plan B. And it was Australians who were left over the summer to pay the price for these failures, literally at $10 to $15 per rapid antigen test, if you could find one, if you could get your hands on one. Now, I spoke to pharmacists in regional Victoria, and out of 20 that I contacted over the summer, none of them knew when they were going to get any supply of rapid antigen tests. The Morrison government turned COVID testing into a lottery this summer. They turned our health system into a lottery this summer, and Australians are still paying the price for that failure. Senator Walsh, your time has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President, and I thank you for this MPI today. I didn't get a question in question time, so it's wonderful to be able to answer Dorothy Dixer. Thank you. The, I say it's a Dixer because it is clear to everyone that the Morrison government's COVID-19 response has been an overwhelming success. Has it been perfect? No. And the Prime Minister has acknowledged that, as has the Leader in the Senate. However, the overall response to the pandemic by the Morrison government has been one of the best in the world, and that is simply fact. When it comes to dealing with a once-in-a-century pandemic, there is no playbook, there is no history to guide the government or decision-makers on what has worked previously and what has not. Now, Labor love coming in here with their hindsight goggles on. I think their hindsight goggles work so well they could walk in here backwards. Maybe they could have tell, told me how I could have avoided getting COVID over summer, which was confirmed by a rat test, which I bought at my local pharmacy. Now, there was undoubtedly things can go wrong, and they did, as we've acknowledged. But what is important is how we learn from these mistakes and how we respond to these lessons. And this is something that the government has done extremely well on any measure. You only have to look at the vaccine rollout last year. On the 21st of March, the Prime Minister announced publicly that the Australian government had a comprehensive plan to offer COVID-19 vaccines to all Australians by the end of October 2021. And guess what? We saw that actually occur. We hit 80 per cent vaccinated by the end of October. Now, no one said that the vaccine rollout was going to be in a straight line or some perfect model that, uh, that Labor seemed to think was the Prime Minister's one and only job, or sorry, was it two jobs that you, you think the Prime Minister does? Shows you're not fit for the job. Of course it was going to ramp up exponentially. We delayed the rollout deliberately over summer because we did not have COVID in the country. We watched what other countries did. We learnt from how they rolled theirs out, and then we accepted the, those, we learnt those lessons and moved from there. There were countries that had uh, COVID breakouts that were killing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people, and needed the vaccine more than we did, and, and they got it ahead of us, which I think we should all accept is the right thing. But we still met our promise to the Australian people. The Prime Minister made a promise and we met it. There were definitely hurdles along the way, such as the change of health advice on the AstraZeneca vaccine. However, the gov government responded to those changes and now we are one of the world's most vaccinated countries. As it currently stands, Australia has over 95 per cent of the population with a first dose and over 93 per cent protected with a second dose. 
This ranks as six out of all OECD countries in the world and must be celebrated as a remarkable achievement. Now, I think it's important to remind Senator Brown that the effects of the Omicron outbreak had global repercussions which has affected supply chains around the world. It is not just Australia that these supply chains were, that, uh, these supply chains were put under pressure, but globally we have seen issues occurring. But lucky for us, the Morrison government acted swiftly and decisively to mitigate the squeeze on supply chains and worked with industry at every level to iron out these problems. Decisions such as a change of food and grocery supply chain, close contact arrangements, undoubtedly had a positive impact on these issues. With all aspects of the COVID-19 response, the government has followed the expert medical advice. The first three rapid antigen self-tests were only approved by the TGA on the 13th of October for supply from the 1st of November. So, of course, we started from a different position because we didn't have massive outbreaks. We dealt with them at that time. Rats were not a suitable testing regime for Delta. But since then, the government has worked to ensure they are available to those who need them. The Commonwealth provides free rats to residential aged care facilities, of which we are responsible. We have already provided millions of rats to re residential aged care centres, and it was the Morrison government's response that has kept Australians safe while not destroying our economy as the Labor Party would have. Senator Van, your time has expired. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents